Well, uh, my name is Derek Sosby, and uh, I was born in 1930, May 26. And uh, I was born down Rutland Road, facing the Stones as brewery. My father worked there 34 years, and uh, I was involved there during the Blitz and things like that. And uh, that was something I'll never forget because I saw a German warplane and they caught it in the searchlights off Parkwood Springs Akak batteries. And they got, I was about 11 at the time, and I saw, I said to my father, look at that, father, look, they've got that plane. And all you saw was silver balls exploding in the sky, and that was the Akak fire. And he was diving from searchlight to searchlight, this plane, and he finally got away. And I was really annoyed. I said to my father, he's got away, Dad, they've missed him. And that was a disappointment at that age, you know. Right. And uh, you're speaking about breweries. Well, Sheffield had quite a few breweries. And the only visions in my mind at the moment, and one was Stoner's Brewery, that were on Rutland Road. Then we had one in town, which was uh, near, the, which is near, which was near the police station now on Bridge Street, and that were called Gilmore's Brewery. And opposite that was another brewery which was taken over, that was Tenants Brewery, which everybody in Sheffield drunk and Gilmore's, which were taken over by Tetley's. And then the other brewery was on Nursery Street, it was called Carter Miller and Birds. And then they finally moved to Clay Wheels Lane. And then I vaguely remember Pond Street, when there were houses in Pond Street, and going down, I think it was Flat Street first and Pond Street, there was a brewery on the right there, but I don't remember the name of that. Okay. So we were all right for breweries in Sheffield. <laughs> uh, didn't the steel workers have to drink it to remain hydrated or something, didn't I they? I think that's it. Uh, Sheffield people, I mean, they're better off today than they've ever been, I think, because all Sheffield people, or the majority, worked on horrible, mucky, filthy, hot jobs. Even the women, they did what they called buffing. They polished cutlery. And it was a terribly filthy job because they were using sand and buffing materials and used to, their overalls were brown paper. They used to clobber themselves in brown paper because that's more or less only protect, protection they had in them days, you know. But everybody worked hard, you know. Did you say your, your mum worked in? She No, my mother worked as a buffer, but uh, <clears throat> I knew women that did work during the war in Atfields, which is now Meadowhall, and they were machining shells in millions, you know, there was millions, armour plate, there was armour plate made, which mostly men would have seen to that, massive rolling mills, rolling the armour plate out, you know, fascinating to see it done. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your, your earliest school memories and where did you go to school? <coughs> well... What was your first day of school like? Pardon? What was your first day of school like? Do you remember that? Uh, I don't think I can <laughs> quite remember that. Oh, okay. It was no problem because as a little boy I had a wonderful life. People were so easy going, you know. Really easy going. I went to Woodside School first and that was halfway up Rutland Road climbing a hill. Yeah. And we had some wonderful teachers. We had uh, it went from five till nine, I think, the, the age group, and then from nine till eleven. Then I left and went to Burngreave School, which was off Burngreave Road. But the schools were lovely. Uh, they were old-fashioned schools with big walls around them, you know, for safety. They talk about paedophiles today, but even in them days, I've only thought about it since I've got older. They've got giant gates, steel gates, and stone walls all round, which I never... Was that to keep you in or to keep them out? To keep them out, <laughs> you know. Um, this is something we never knew about. I, I don't think I knew about Peter Falls till, till only a few years ago, you know. Yeah. And uh, it was lovely school, in, uh, especially when I got from 11 to 14. I left at 14 to be apprentice draftsman. And uh, it was a lovely period. We had lovely teachers. 
Where, where, did you, where did you go to be an apprentice draftsman? What was the place? I went to a firm called Stokes, Taylor and Shaw. They were civil engineers on John Street. That was my first job. <clears throat> and as I was walking up John Street, I got off the tram. I was 14, as I was saying. I saw Bramall Lane virtually flattened by bombs. You see, this was 1944. And I thought, oh, even Hitler would have Wednesday eye right then. Because they blasted Bramall Lane and Wednesday got away with it. You you're know. over that way, aren't you? You're, so you're a Wednesday eye? Right? Yes, yeah, I'm a yeah, Wednesday eye. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but school days for me are wonderful because uh, uh, it was mostly practical. Uh, I was in a metalwork class and we had a wonderful teacher and uh, he taught us most things about working with copper, working with steel, you know, all things like that. Very nice teachers. Even though I used to get cane red a <laughs> Don't mean a naughty boy. Um, you talked about Bowenbury School. Could you, could you say a little bit more about that? What, 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 what teachers there were remarkable or, or yes. friends or events? Very nice. All very nice teachers. You, you, you like them. They like you and they talk. I mean, I was never musically inclined. I still aren't really uh, for such as a choir, but this teacher says, I'm going to teach you all to be a choir. And I thought, there's no chance with me because I was called a grunter, but it blended us all in. And I just was in the small choir and it was really lovely, you know, Ooh, surprising that I hadn't got a clue, you know. Do you remember the teacher's name? Yes, Mr. Murray. They called him Mr. Murray, I can remember his name. My main teacher was called Mr. Snell. And the headmaster was uh, Mr. Scowcroft. He was one of the old-fashioned kinds, but a very good headmaster, you know. What did you do with the singing? Can you remember any events? Yes, I do. Uh, I can't sing as I told you. <laughs> but to make my life laugh, I usually sing Up With The Jolly Roger Boys. I don't know if you've heard it. It's up with the Jolly Roger Boys and up we go to sea. There's heat of foam when the Jolly Roger's on and the wind is on the lee and the wind is on the lee and it goes on, it's wonderful and the other one is uh, it's about the, the local poacher and uh, I'd have to study to bring that to mind and that's so funny as well Did you, did you sing these in public? No, no, it was just at school events uh, just to entertain or in my case I don't have to entertain could you, yeah. you talk about some Sheffield events that you attended and where were they? Uh, like big events, lots of people, all that yes, sort of thing. Yes. Uh, well, during the war, we were a bit restricted, you see. Yes. That was from 39 so you're, you're, to 45. You're in your prime. Yeah. Pardon? You were in your prime, weren't you? Well, I was a little yeah. devil yeah. then, I think. You know, I used to. I know nearly everywhere they were in Sheffield because in them days, there wasn't much traffic and there wasn't problems with kiddies, with adults. So my mother used to just see me all right, and then I'd roam off. We used to go all over the place, walking, you know, seeing places. But my wife, she hadn't got a clue about when we first got married, you know, because girls were different, weren't they? Yeah, it was a, a really nice school. Oh, and as I say, I, uh, my first job was as an apprentice draftsman, which I always liked drawing at school. <clears throat> I still like drawing today, but I did that job for approximately two years and uh, I had to pack it in because uh, there was so much, to me anyway, there was so much snobbery among some of these office people, you know. I couldn't believe it, uh, the attitude they used to take and all that. And I decided to go on their building size to get practical experience. And from then on, I stayed as a bricklayer for the rest of my life. I was a building foreman, but uh, I used to like building because it's something you can look back on and see like, you know. What do you look back on and see? What have you built? Well, uh, I've worked on some nice buildings, but it's a laugh in our family. Uh, they all say I must have been a rotten bricklayer because most of them have been blown down. <laughs> I worked on quite a few 13-storey flats, which weren't particularly nice buildings. But uh, I worked on some nice buildings. We had two big gasification plants, one 
at Orgreave, Sheffield, and the other one was at Mamba's Main. And I worked there on, they called them coke ovens. And uh, they were a technical job to do, to build. And it was quite a decent job, you know. Yeah. But we built out buildings as well, which were lovely red brick buildings, well designed, you know. And they were nice to work on. And a lot of them have all been blown down like, you know. It's a shame, really, because they changed from normal gas to no sea gas, you know. And so at times and all, I think one day they'll come back to coal made or produce gas, you know, as things start to run out. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think what else. Um, I'm just trying to get you back to any, any events like fairs and fates and things like that that you were Fairs? Of, yeah, or, you know, well, when you were a little boy. Well, when I was a little boy, I used to have a, a regular fairground in Sheffield, and it was on Blount Street. I don't know if you know Blount Street. And it, it, it was a. <clears throat> it was basically, I don't know whether it were Bedford's steelworks, whether it was their stockyard for ingots and all that, but they used to get the fair in there, and they had something called a shamrock. And that was like a caged thing that swung. He built momentum up, swung and swung till he almost came vertical, and backwards and forwards, and all the girls used to scream, and he was covered in uh, ropes like nets, like commandos have, you know. So girls were clinging to them, and boys were helping them, like you know, it was nice and funny. <laughs> but uh, fairgrounds were ever so nice, really, and I should say, price was reasonable because today, I mean. These in Sheffield at the moment, I think it's two pound fifty to go on them, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Which is a lot of money, isn't it? It sounded like that thing you were describing. Shamrock. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, well, I had a happy childhood because I was in a youth club as well. Uh, they called it the Rutland Hall Youth Club, and uh, when I was about sixteen, we went to which they used to organise it in trips and things like. We went to something called Lend a Hand on the Land. And this meant we travelled to Northumberland and we were helping these farmers to clear land of uh, bracken and all that so the sheep could graze, you know. And it was lovely. And it were mixed, it were boys and girls, but they kept us dormitories separate. And uh, when we were on the moors, it used to lash it down well with no real protection. But what they did, they got half of a barrage balloon. Have you heard of a barrage yeah. balloon? It's a giant fabric coated thing, massive thing. So it was cut in half and pegged down. So if it really came down, we used to all rush in there to get out of the rain. So that was fun and games with girls again, you see. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we did. And uh, we had a little old lorry and that used to take us onto the site. And then we'd all spread out and we had sides in. And we used to cut all this bracken down. And I remember one night we were getting back on this little lorry. And I looked at this lad climbing on the lorry. And his toe cap had completely gone all leather. Somebody had done it and he hadn't noticed it. And he, you could see his toes. But he weren't injured, so he was dead lucky. <laughs> yeah. Happy days, really, then. Yeah. Do you remember the barrage balloons in Sheffield? Barrage balloons, oh, where, definitely. Where, where were they, they situated? Well, there was one, uh, they used to put them round near Akak sites, that's guns firing at warplanes. And uh, there was one on Green Lane, which is not far from Netherthorpe Road. And I used to watch them because they were all lovely girls and they were called WAFs. Mm. You know, they were RF people. Mm. And they pull it down. It ran about a quarter cable, and uh, it was quite big. I don't remember dimensions, but it was full of hydrogen, you see, which were a bit lethal. So it, they they leaked considerably, I think. So every so often they pulled them down, and girls connected. They had a big truck with massive cylinders on, all leading into one big pipe, low pressure pipe, and they blew the balloons up. And if they saw any gases coming out used to just patch them just patch them with this same material and then they'd send them up till they were just a speck in the sky 
and uh, they were really fascinated because they all busy, busy girls and they loved the job. They had all ropes on the side to stabilise it, you know, yeah. till they filled it full of gas. And one, and I used to watch it quite readily, but one particular day, something terrible happened. I wasn't there and it was a windy day and there was a giant chimney, only probably two or three hundred yards away and the balloon trailed out and its cable got wrapped around the chimney and uh, they sent for Steeple Jackson, the fire brigade and everything, and two men got killed on that. What happened? Uh, I suppose it were hard to organise in them days. I don't know whether they started to try and pull it in or what, but the Steeple Jacks were up there, two of them, and they started to pull on it. Maybe the wind that did it, I've never found out about that. And they fell to the death. It was really terrible. On Green Lane in um, Everthorpe. It's more or less classed as what? It's not neat. It might be neat send. It's uh, it, you know at the bottom of Netherthorpe Road, that giant roundabout. Yeah, uh, it yeah. comes down to Oil Street. Uh, it's on Shales Moor. Do you know Shales, Shales Moor? Yeah. Shales yeah. Moor. Yeah. Well, it's there. like on Shales Moor. The and church. Then, you see yes. The church there. And. Uh, the site was there, Green Lane, it's Cornish Street, it's a real old-fashioned part of Sheffield, that industrial part, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the River Don is close by, which uh, they got a lot of the power from, because uh, years and years ago they had water wheels, didn't they, working off River Don? Yeah, yeah. Things like that. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's great. I think we've got plenty there because yeah. I've, I've got to cut all this down and edit it into a, into a yes. digestible chunks. Well, I but could go on, really, honestly. I, well, well, I, I'm I'm happy for you too. I'm just trying to think what what uh, what I need to know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could talk a little bit about going out nightlife in Sheffield. Uh, well, Sheffield at that time, from me right. being a teenager, as a teenager, I didn't drink at all. But as we got towards us. 20s, we'd occasionally go out and have a drink then when I got married and that we had friends and Sheffield was a town of pubs you know, happy times it was because uh, obviously when you'd had beer it made you feel happy anyway but other than that uh, uh, they had pianos, most pubs had pianos in them you know, so they start playing a piano and people would get up voluntary and sing along and Oh, they were a wonderful time. The pub life in Sheffield were absolutely lovely. Can you talk about a couple of those that you used to enjoy uh, as a young man? Or Names of the pubs? Yes. Well, we used, uh, when we moved up in 1957, me and my wife, we moved up onto the Leelas Valley estate. That was our first house. And we've been up there ever since. It was 1957 and we've been up 52 years. And it, we found a lovely spot, you know, it's up near the RAF camp. Right. They had an RAF camp, I don't know if you knew that. At the far end, yeah. Like yes. Where people do learning, they learn to drive now. That's right, that's finished now. Though. But then, it had giant hangars. And what it was, it were kept, I mean it ran the outskirts of Sheffield at that time. As we thought. And uh, they used to have massive hangars. And these girls again were wafts. And they had male officers in charge of everything. And they used to take the balloons there to patch them, repair them, and then test them. They tested them with compressed air, though. They filled them up with air, you see. So then they could put the patches on, and then they'd use hydrogen later on type of thing. And then it, uh, it were all disbanded, I should think, about 1955, I should think. And it was just left derelict, and then it was turned into a, a learner's driver centre. Lightwood, and uh, but me and my three sons have both been a motorcycle enthusiast, I still am. And we used to, I used to take them on there to teach them to drive, to do trials riding, scrambling, and it was brilliant. I mean, we didn't get it where people because it's out of the way, so we all enjoyed ourselves. If you fell off that or it, it was safe enough because you weren't going terribly fast, you know, you were practicing trials riding. And it was lovely for us, but they finally closed it all up permanently with a fence. 
and they're still deciding what to do with it. It's a valuable piece of land that, you know, a, val a really valuable piece of land. But I'm not sure. I've heard all kinds of rumours, but I'm not sure what they're going to do with it, you know. Um, how do you get the model making? I should say from a little boy, about say, 12 or probably less. Uh, during the war, my favourite plane was the Spitfire, obviously. So I saw this model of a Spitfire, and it was hard work because instead of being balsa wood, it was pretty hard wood that you had to carve, you know. So I used to make Spitfire, little Spitfires out of wood. You could buy kits and Bristol bow fighter bombers, fighter bombers and all things like that. And then over the years, I've constantly had bright ideas, oh, I'll make this, I'll make that. And uh, I've made a lot of trains, locomotives over the years. And I've took several to children's hospital, but you can't do that anymore. For some reason, that's health and safety again. And one day I took this train I'd made local and then a couple of weeks later, I got a letter saying, thank you, Mr. Sosby. We appreciate the doll's house you made for us. <laughs> they got something wrong, you know what I mean? And uh, I've, uh, there's a school now, it's been rebuilt, and they've changed the name. It was called Erdin's, but it's called another name now. And I've done a, donated things for them, little lorry, trains, and a... Uh, Give them a couple of bicycles all the way up with my great grandsons, you know. So they appreciated it because they've a little area there where they can ride all around, you know. It's ever so nice. Yeah. Yeah, Sheffield's a, I should say, a lovely city to live in. It, it, it's altered and things aren't probably as good as it were, but it's still a nice city, I think, you know. People are friendly and that. We've got two good football teams. <laughs> One's better than the other, but yeah. um, <laughs> It's hard to say. <laughs> You've got a veterans badge on there. What's that about? It's just uh, our national servicemen. I, I uh, served my time as a bricklayer, and then at 21, I did my national service. You had to go in. I got deferred. I should have gone in when I was 18, but I got deferred till I was 21, and then I went in the army. Uh, I did uh, two years and uh, went to all the shop first, which were hell upon earth place that. And then uh, I went to Dusseldorf in Germany on the, one of the biggest vehicle units in, in Germany, and, you know, massive. There were thousands of vehicles, tanks, everything you can imagine. And that were two years another happiness because we maintained them and we could drive anything we wanted and I took quite a few to drive because I were older than them yeah. and uh, we used to call them clutch happy because everybody wants to drive, you know, you know, everybody wants to drive and I used to tell them like take your time because this one I first went on in Germany were called Oldenburg and they were right in the north of Germany, and it was an ex-RAF field, well, Luftwaffe field. And uh, so I used to say, right, so I gave them the basics, and then they just said, go along and just drive around as far as you wanted, you know. And they got very good drivers, because you could make mistakes and it didn't show. And you'd rectify it for them, you know what I mean, things like that. Well, did, you, did you get a uh, rank in the army? Yeah, I was a, a full corporal. Yeah. Uh, I never tried for it, I just was conscientious, I loved my job, and it happened. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they want, uh, I were an athlete in the army who stood run the mile. I got it down to four minutes I'm twenty. Gonna, I was going to ask you, four minutes twenty five, right? Really? Yeah. I was going to ask you about sports. So it did was. You get involved uh, in Sheffield sports at all, just to bring it back, sorry. Just, yes. Um, uh, can you remember any sports events in Sheffield that you were involved in? And did it come from the army or did it? Yes, I, I never carried it on when I got the mob because we'd got, we finally finished up with three boys and uh, money were always short, even though I got a good job. So I didn't seem to be able to find time to do it somehow. I'd have loved to have done, but somehow what we're working and this and that, I never got around to it. But Tiring work. Pardon? Tiring work. 
Well, it can be, yes. Yeah, it keeps you fit, though, because you're bending all day, you're lifting pretty heavy weights. And uh, the training I got for athletics was absolutely marvellous. We got everything we required, good food and like, you know. And uh, so I, they put me into the mall. They said, where have you been running then? I says, I've never run in my life, only at school, just general things like, oh, he says, right. So they trained me up and uh, I did quite well at it. And uh, I got the mile down, which went 1953, the last, the last one. And Roger Bannister, he did, I think it was two years after, or maybe a year after, but he got all scientific help, you know, he was a doctor, telling him what his art would stand and all that, whereas we had to just run as fast as we could. And as I say, he got it down to four, he did the four, he was the first man to do the four minute mile. I've since found out he wasn't. There was another chap did it, but it wasn't done officially. And I think it was a Sheffield chap. Was it? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think his name. Wood. His surname was Woods or Wood. And he brought the four minute mile before Bannister, but it wasn't recognised because it hadn't been done officially. That's a shame, isn't it? Do you know if that was done in Sheffield, that attempt? Or Pardon? Was it done in Sheffield, that, that mile attempt? Or yes, with, with Woods. Yeah. Yes, I'm trying to think of his name. He died recently. He was the same age as me, roughly. Uh, he did it, it was one evening or something. All his club, I think, prepared to do it, but they'd no official timekeepers, you see. It has to be done legitimately, do not it? Yeah. And he definitely did this sub four minute mile. And unlucky for him, Roger Bannister did it a short while after and he got recognition for it. 